Um, we are co-sponsored this time with the Alliance for Securing Democracy from the German Marshall Fund. Um, and together we put together a seminar on the question of foreign electoral interference. Um, and so this is a question that uh, has become at the forefront of issues of electoral integrity in recent years, especially starting um, with that American election back in 2016. Um, and it's an interesting question because I think we have conceptions of what foreign interference in elections looks like, uh, but that isn't necessarily borne out in, in reality. And so um, today we're going to talk about questions of what foreign interference can look like, how they impact trust in elections, um, and then what it, organizations like the Alliance for Securing Democracy are doing to help monitor these sorts of issues. Um, so a few housekeeping things, and then I'll introduce the two speakers that we'll have today. Um, so we just ask that you keep yourself muted until um, we ask you to unmute if we, for our question and answer period. I suspect we'll run about an hour and 15 minutes or so, um, but feel free if you need, if you need to jet uh, at one o'clock to do so. Um, and we just ask that yeah, you help us to make a um, supportive and uh, encouraging and collegial environment um, and we do have our admin assistant, Maddie, who is um, going to be monitoring the Zoom room. Um, and we will just pop you back into the wait room if uh, there's any behavior that we, um, that is not the kind of encouraging and collegial behavior that we um, hope to have today. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the two speakers we have today. Each of our seminars has an academic speaker and a practitioner speaker. Um, and so we're very excited to have Lauren Prather from the University of California, San Diego. I heard her speak at a conference this summer and uh, was like, absolutely, I want, I want to hear more about her project. Um, she'll be presenting today um, part of a, a, a book project with Sarah Bush. Um, so just to give a little bit of a bio, Lauren Prather is an assistant professor of political science at the University of California, San Diego in the G School of Global Policy and Strategy and a research affiliate with the Policy Design and Evaluation Lab, and a member of the Evidence and Governance and Politics. Her work focuses on political behavior in international relations, democracy promotion and democratization, Middle East politics, and experimental methods. And as I mentioned earlier, she will be speaking today about her uh, book project on foreign electoral interventions and their effects on trust. And this is my cat. Um, and so the uh, other speaker we have today is from the practitioner world. Um, so we had Brett Chafer, who is the Media and Digital Disinformation Fellow at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. Um, he's the manager and creator of the Hamilton 2.0, um, which is an online open source dashboard, which tracks the outputs of Russian, Chinese, and Iranian state media outlets, diplomats, and government officials. He's an expert in computational propaganda, state-backed information operations and tech regulations, and has spoken about this at conferences around the world and has advised uh, many governments and international organizations about this issue. Um, he's also written in a variety of publications you have probably read, like the New York Times, USA Today, Washington Post, um, and, and been interviewed on many media organizations. So it, it, like Lauren, it, it's an honor to be able to have him speak today. So a bit about the format, we're gonna get, let Lauren speak first, um, she'll kind of give the academic background on what's going on in this field of foreign intervention in elections. And then we're going to move on to Brett, who will give kind of the more practical on the ground side of things. And then following that, we'll open up for Q&A. Uh, if you'd like to uh, speak, I just ask that you um, either raise your hand using the raise hand function, or you can put your comments into the little chat function and I can read that out um, and I'll try to keep a good balance between the two. Um, so without further ado then, there's a lot to take in all at once, but um, we'll, we will let um, Lauren uh, take, a, take it away um, on presenting part of the book project, Monitors and Meddlers, How Foreign Actors Influence Local Trust in Elections. Thanks so, so much, Holly. It. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and thanks for everyone attending. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. So uh, just to give you um, a setup for what I'm gonna discuss today, I'm going to focus more on the background and theory part of the book. I do have a lot of data in this presentation, um, so depending on time, I may go through it or we can come back to it in the Q&A. So if you're interested in the data side of things, I will touch on it, uh, but I'll, I can come back to it in the Q&A. Okay, so to give you um, 
uh, just you know, to set the stage here, uh, foreign influences on elections are pervasive. I wouldn't call all of them interference. Um, interference to me has a negative valence to it. Um, we tend to use the term influence or intervention, which can um, describe both uh, democracy enhancing actions that foreign actors take around elections and also democracy undermining actions. Um, so these foreign influences can take many different forms, including international election monitoring, where countries or organizations send teams to uh, countries holding elections uh, to monitor their and evaluate um, how those elections conform to international principles of democracy. Um, foreign influences can also take the form of democracy promotion um, or democracy aid. So this is would be different from monitoring missions. This would be things like um, funding to help train party leaders on how to form political parties and that sort of thing. Um, and then foreign influences can also have this negative valence that I was describing where they actually have a democracy undermining um, form. And we typically call that foreign election meddling, where an international actor interferes in an election to help one side or another. Um, the important thing to understand about these foreign influences on elections is the um, foreign actors, they want to not only affect the conduct of the election, whether it be democracy enhancing or democracy undermining, but they also have an interest in what citizens on the ground believe. They want to influence electoral trust. International election monitors, they want to promote trust in elections that deserve it. So if an election has integrity, they want citizens on the ground to trust those electoral institutions. Um, election meddlers, on the other hand, they may see it as being in their advantage to undermine trust in elections, cause chaos, and uh, ultimately, um, undermine democracy and the perception of democracy. So the research question that our book tackles in a very broad way is what are the consequences of foreign influences on elections for local attitudes and behaviors in these target countries? So I want to give you a, a bit of a background of the election cycle. I'm sure a lot of the people attending are aware of um, the election cycle. Uh, Pippa Norris, um, one of the founders of these projects, you know, um, was very instrumental in our thinking here. Um, and so we talk about the foreign intervention timeline as first starting with governments. So governments can decide um, as a part of their electoral process whether to accept or invite foreign electoral interventions. Um, this this um, step is sometimes skipped by um, interventions that are um, targeted by foreign meddlers that want to just interfere in an election and they don't necessarily need a domestic partner to do so. But nevertheless, actually most interventions, even foreign meddling, have a partner on the ground. And so um, governments decide whether to accept and in, or invite these foreign electoral interventions first. Um, then foreign actors decide whether and how to intervene in the election. So uh, to give you an example from international election monitoring, um, frequently uh, some actors that are intent on cheating will nevertheless invite election monitors from other countries because they think it gives them some advantage either in the international community to display the, they're abiding by this norm of inviting election monitors, um, or they think just by having election monitors at their elections that they're conveying some sort of legitimacy to uh, their domestic populace. So actually, just because a government invites an international monitoring team doesn't necessarily mean that the foreign actor is going to accept that invitation. And in fact, we've seen in recent years that international election monitors are attuned to the fact that just their presence could legitimize fraudulent elections and so have actually started to decline some invitations. Um, okay, and so then once these foreign actors decide whether and how to conduct their intervention, then we see um, citizens interacting with these foreign actors, observing them at their polling stations, hearing about them in, their, in, in the news. Um, and so citizens can then update their beliefs about how credible they think the election is um, when they learn about these foreign influences. 
and decide how to politically engage. Um, we do think confidence in elections is associated with important political behaviors like turnout, um, like voting. Um, and then ultimately we have these dotted lines kind of going back to the government and the foreign actors because we think governments and foreign actors are thinking about citizens of likelihood of updating their beliefs when they are initially deciding whether to in invite foreign electoral interventions and when foreign actors are deciding how to intervene. Um, so this is sort of our timeline that we have in the back of our heads when we're thinking about what's going on um, in the ground on the ground. Um, okay, so then if we zoom in on the citizens, because our book is really a theory about the citizen, um, we are wanting to specify some qualities of citizens on the ground. And we think there's sort of two important um, elements that citizens um, have about their elections. One is they have access to some information about elections, but ultimately they have some uncertainty about the quality of their elections. Um, and there's really two sources of uncertainty for citizens. Um, individuals have uncertainty about candidates types. Um, so candidates could either be true Democrats. This is small D Democrats, not um, Democrats as in Democrats and Republicans. Um, so individuals have basically uncertainty about candidates types, whether they're going to cheat at the election or not. So a true Democrat wouldn't cheat, a pseudo Democrat um, holds elections, but intends to cheat. Okay, so individuals have some uncertainty about these candidates types, um, and they also have uncertainty about whether their electoral institutions are fair. Citizens can't observe every step of the electoral process. They don't know um, the extent to which votes are counted accurately, et cetera. And so they have some uncertainty about their electoral institutions. And what we think foreign interventions are doing is providing information that helps resolve some of this uncertainty that candidate um, that individuals have about candidates types and the fairness of their electoral institutions. Um, and this new information can then affect perceptions of election credibility based on whether or not individuals update their beliefs about these two factors. So how exactly does that work? So we think that the direction of foreign actors effects depends on the type of influencer intervention. So as I said, these interventions can have, some of them have democracy enhancing um, properties and some of them have democracy undermining properties. And so whether or not foreign actors increase confidence in elections or decrease it is gonna depend on the type of intervention. So we think, you know, our book is titled Monitors and Meddlers. So we really take these two categories and interrogate them. So we think monitoring can increase perceptions of election credibility because it conveys information about candidates in the play, electoral playing field. So first of all, going back to that timeline, international election monitors are only able to attend elections if governments invite them. And so if an individual on the ground sees a monitor at their elections or hears about monitors at the elections, um, they can infer that the government had to invite them. And so if they think the government invited monitors to their election, then they may update their beliefs about the candidate's type. A pseudo-democrat and uh, a elected official that was intending to cheat wouldn't invite monitors to the election. I think that's a logical jump that individuals could have. Um, so monitoring could increase perceptions of election credibility because it sends a signal that their government is not intending to cheat. Um, but even if you didn't think that that signal about the candidate's type was strong, you still might, as an individual on the ground, think that election fraud is less likely to occur if monitors are present. So even if you don't update your beliefs about candidate's type, you still might think fraud is less likely and therefore have more confidence in your election. So meddling works in the opposite direction, right? So meddling decreases perceptions of election credibility by conveying the same types of information. True Democrats would be less likely to accept help from a foreign meddler. So if you think about foreign meddling as being a type of cheating, then seeing or hearing about meddling at your election on the side of one candidate may make you think that that candidate is doing other types of cheating or simply that meddling itself is cheating and therefore that candidate has cheated. 
Um, again, though, if you don't update about candidates type, you still could believe that the election has less integrity and therefore have less confidence in it because you think that the meddling has actually made the electoral playing field less fair. And so these same mechanisms can lead meddling to decrease perceptions of election credibility. Now we sort of have a alternative hypothesis is that all forms of foreign influence could cause people to react negatively um, because elections are these um, uh, you know, pinnacles of sovereign institutions in countries and therefore, any form of foreign influence could be perceived negatively and reduce confidence in elections, even those democracy enhancing um, interventions. Okay, so um, from, the, from this theory, we test two hypotheses in our study. Um, and I'm gonna zero in on the meddling hypotheses uh, because I can't present the whole book in this um, presentation. Uh, the theme sort of of this panel is more, I think about foreign interference and foreign meddling. So um, we're gonna focus on those hypotheses. The first is um, drawn directly from the theory I just stated that when individuals hear about meddling, this is going to decrease perceptions of election credibility. Um, and then we have a conditional hypothesis that we don't think that this hypothesis about awareness of meddling is going to affect perceptions of election credibility all the time, um, but only under certain conditions. And so um, one of the conditions we look at is that we think election meddling is going to have a larger negative effect on perceptions of election credibility when meddlers are perceived as capable. So weak meddling, may still indicate candidates are pseudo-democrats if meddling is welcomed or invited. But if people see a foreign country trying to interfere in their election, but think that country doesn't have a chance in actually changing the outcome of the election, this may not change whether or not they um, believe the election is, is fair or that the outcome is um, uh, the correct one. Okay. So in terms of the research design for the book, um, because our theory is focused at the level of the citizen, we need data at the level of individuals. So we draw evidence from three cases. We look at Tunisia, the elections immediately post Arab Spring for parliament and for the president that were held in 2014. Uh, we look at survey data from 2016 and 2018 that we collected. And we also look at data from the country of Georgia, which we collected in 2018 around their presidential election. So what's interesting about these cases, why we selected them is that they represent a diverse set of democracies. So Tunisia was holding the first elections for parliament and president after the Arab Spring in a long, long history of dictatorship. The United States is a democracy, but was experiencing some backsliding um, in 2016 and 2018. And Georgia is considered to be a partial democracy. There are some elements of um, autocratic influence in, in Georgia, but they do hold elections and they have elements of um, uh, freedom and fair, fairness as well. So um, then uh, obviously the other important point here is that all have experienced some form of foreign influence. Um, Tunisia, the US and Georgia all have international election monitors present at their elections, and they've all experienced some level of foreign influence. So what we do is we use panel surveys. So these are um, two wave panel surveys. In the first wave, we interview individuals, and then a few weeks later, we interview them again. So one of the reasons we do this is we can't simply correlate people's confidence in elections in a survey with the presence of foreign actors at elections. Um, and this is because foreign actors don't intervene in elections at random. So if it's the case, for example, that international election monitors only go to elections that um, have low confidence among people in the target country, then we would unnecessarily potentially find that monitoring causes people to have low confidence in elections. And that would be um, an incorrect assumption. So because foreign actors don't intervene in elections at random, we can't simply look at the correlation between election confidence and foreign influence. Um, 
Then similarly, awareness of actions of foreign actors is not distributed randomly among the public. So for example, after an election, if I supported a losing candidate, I may seek out news media or information um, that perhaps overemphasizes the role of foreign influence at the election in a negative way. Um, and on the opposite side of things, winners may seek out different sources of information. And so aware, because awareness of foreign influences is not distributed randomly, this could also cause us to come to false conclusions. So we um, overcome this limitation of observational analysis by using experiments that are embedded in our surveys. So I'm going to just briefly dig into the US data. And then, like I said, we can circle back to some of this data um, in the Q&A. Um, I don't think I have to give too much background on meddling in US elections, but I'm going to just simply say um, in 2016, multiple US security agencies concluded that Russia did attempt to influence the 2016 election. Um, and then the setting of our survey, which was around the 2018 mid midterm elections in the US, there were warnings of efforts by different actors to influence the election or meddle in the election. Um, and the actors that were, or the foreign actors that were specified by these intelligence agencies um, were China, Iran, and Russia. And so those are the foreign meddlers that feature in our study. Um, so one thing that is interesting about this um, warning system that happened before the 2018 midterm elections is we actually think that the um, influence of this type of information uh, on competence in elections is a little bit ambiguous. So you might say it could conform to our theory when people before an election hear about the possibility of foreign meddling that decreases their confidence. Um, but we actually think there is an alternative story here, which is if the government signals that it is detecting foreign influence and is transparent about um, meddling, it could actually have the opposite effect, which is to um, signal that go the government is the democratic type because they're being transparent about meddling and that the electoral playing field is going to be fair because the government may be able to address or prevent the meddling and actually ensure the integrity of the vote. So while there is a possibility that learning about election meddling before an election could decrease confidence, we also think it could work through the mechanisms in the opposite way and increase confidence. Um, and I'll show you what we find in our data. Um, and there was no evidence in 2018 um, that this meddling was invited or received any cooperation from US candidates. So this form of meddling before 2018 did actu actually did not reveal um, anything about the candidates type in these elections. Um, and then after the election in 2018, officials concluded that Russia's influence campaign was not as widespread as in 2016. Okay, so for our 2018 survey, we fielded, again, this online panel survey to 2,000 Americans via a company called Survey Sampling International. The first wave occurred immediately pre-election, and the second was immediately post-election. And around 1,300 respondents um, returned from wave one to be re-interviewed in wave two. Uh, each survey included a vignette experiment. So this is essentially a paragraph describing a situation with certain um, elements of that paragraph randomly assigned to different individuals. A control group also received no information about election meddling. So this is what the paragraph looked like that we gave individuals. Um, we asked them um, to read this paragraph closely. And the text that appears in red here is the text that was actually randomized to individuals. So people only received one version of the paragraph. Um, and the important piece that I'm gonna discuss in this um, presentation is the information about which actor was present or which actor was potentially meddling in the election. And so you can see that we randomly um, assigned people to read either that Russia was seeking to influence the results of the midterms or China or Iran. So individuals that read this paragraph only read about one of these actors. And so what we can do with that is see how um, learning about the actions of these different actors influenced or not people's confidence in the election. Okay, 
So here's just a brief table of the, the results. So it, in this table, the dependent variable is people's confidence in elections. Um, and a positive value on the coefficient um, indicates that reading that particular version of the paragraph increased people's confidence in the election. And so what's interesting here is the first line, learning about any meddling. So if you read about Russia, China, or Iran, that actually increased significantly your confidence in the election. And we see then if we break it down in model two by Russia, China, and Iran, that each of those three actors had a similar positive effect on people's confidence in elections. So what's interesting here is we do see that pre-election, hearing a warning about meddling actually increased people's confidence in elections, potentially through the mechanisms that I described. That if you think your government is on top of things and it's gonna prevent these actors from meddling in the election and it's being transparent about it, that it might actually improve your confidence in the election. Um, so again, we relied on actual information that was happening around the 2018 election. Um, so it described the actual state of events. Um, and we think that this probably sent a signal that the government was not the cheating type and that the playing field would be more fair, thus increasing trust in the election. And important to note here is only 30% of respondents in these treatment conditions that heard about meddling thought that meddling would be somewhat likely to change the results of the election. So this is going back to that second hypothesis I talked about, which is that we think election meddling is most likely to affect confidence in the elections if people believe that the meddlers are actually capable of, in, of affecting the outcome. And in our sample, as we see, only 30% of respondents actually thought that meddlers were capable of changing the results. So what I want to show you next then is what these um, treatment effects look like by disaggregating our um, survey respondents into those who thought that the actor was capable and thought that the actor was not capable. So here, what we see, just to orient you to the figure, on the left-hand scale, which ra ranges from negative one to 0 0.5, zero here is the baseline. So anything higher than zero indica indicates more confidence in the election. Anything below zero indicates less confidence in the election. And so what you can see is all of the black um, dots here indicating um, the point estimate for individuals that perceived the actor to be incapable are all above zero. Meaning if you perceive China, Iran, or Russia to be incapable of affecting the election results, you had more confidence in the election when you learned about the government's warning. However, the blue dots signify those that perceived the actor to actually be capable of influencing the election. And most of those dots are all below zero, indicating that if you thought the actor was actually able to affect the outcome of the election, that did in fact lower your confidence in the results. So this is again, some indication that the capability of the actor matters and beliefs that they're actually able to affect the outcome of the election matters as well. Okay, so as I said, I'm gonna skip through, um, we had a second experiment that we um, fielded after the election and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, we also had a hypothetical experiment that we fielded in the country of Georgia where we asked people to think about a future election and described meddling that occurred at that election. And again, I'm happy to come back to that, um, the results of that experiment as well. So just to sum up, our key findings then from the experiment and the results I described to you, as well as the other two, is that there's minimal evidence that all kinds of information about meddling decreases electoral trust. But in particular, when people believe that there is capable foreign meddling occurring at their elections, that they're less likely to perceive those elections as credible. But priming people, as I showed, to think about detection of meddling before an enact before an election um, or telling them that meddling was not very widespread, this actually caused them to increase trust in elections. So we think these results have several implications for world politics. Um, so under the right conditions, when meddlers are able to portray their meddling as um, critical to the outcome of the election, 
we think it probably works in the sense that it can undermine citizens' trust in democratic institutions. Um, however, these conditions, um, you know, the perception that meddling is capable and critical to changing the outcome, um, don't always or even usually obtain. So it may be the case actually that meddling isn't as doesn't have as perverse um, of effects on electoral trust as we might otherwise think. Um, but interestingly enough, it also signals that citizens may be more tolerant of foreign influences, especially unsuccessful ones, um, on elections than previously expected, uh, which may explain then policy decisions by um, domestic actors to respond to this meddling. So as we saw in 2016, um, after 2016 in the United States, we saw very little policy movement to address Russia's interference um, in that election. And it may be because citizens simply um, are not demanding it. Um, so we'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing Brett's presentation and to hearing your uh, Q&A. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was fantastic and, and really fascinating. Um, what I'll do just with, without much um, change is, Brett, if you wanted to maybe share your screen, get yourself ready to go. Um, so there, yeah, there you go. So, um, so now we hear from Brett Shaker um, from the Alliance for Securing Democracy um, on some of the work that he's been doing, which is really, really well related to um, what you're talking about today, Lauren. So uh, go for it, Brett. Thanks, Holly. And yeah, that, that was a great segue into our work and it really helps my presentation because I don't have to do much background. So I'm just going to dive in. So I've worked at the Alliance for Securing Democracy basically since we started in 2017. We were set up as a bipartisan organization to look at malign foreign interference in democracies, democratic processes, and efforts that undermine democratic institutions. So we tend to look at it from multiple different perspectives and disciplines, including cybersecurity, emerging technology, malign finance, and money laundering. I handle the information operations part of it. But we always try to look at the cross cuts because we understand that when a nation state runs an information operation, those are often conducted in concert with cyber activity or are financed by uh, money laundering activity. So one of the tools that we built uh, is called Hamilton 2.0. So there was original Hamilton 68 dashboard. We retired in 2018. Hamilton 2.0 is the second version. And what it is, it is essentially an aggregator of all of the data that we're able to collect from attributable state-backed actors across multiple social media platforms. So we also, um, using sort of Lauren's basic sort of understanding of who the main threat actors are, we look at Iran, we look at Russia, we look at China, we track about 900 Twitter accounts from embassies, ambassadors, but particularly from state media accounts. And we also track several channels on YouTube, as well as state-backed websites, and soon we're going to be folding in some CrowdTangle Facebook data as well. So what that looks like is, again, it's essentially just an aggregator. So at any given time, we can go to the dashboard. We can get a general sense of the topics and themes being promoted by each of these actors. 99% of what we see on the dashboard is not disinformation. I mean, these are just sort of normal public diplomacy outputs. Uh, but what the dashboard allows us to do is it allows us to zoom in on a very specific event. So if there were an election, we could set the date range to look at the two day, two or three days or two weeks or two months before the election. But we could also zoom out to do longitudinal analysis to look at, for example, what are the themes Russia's talking about when they're talking about a US election? Uh, but also things like COVID, uh, mis and disinformation, uh, efforts to undermine people's confidence in vaccine safety, things like that. We also have some election specific dashboards. So German election is coming up Sunday. We've run a, a German election project that also allows us to see whether or not some of these foreign actors state media accounts are actually influential in the target population. This statistic was relatively shocking to us and to I think the Germans. We looked over the past year at every major German language uh, media outlet on Facebook. RT Deutsch is the number one outlet by interactions across the entire German language world. So this suggests, although obviously social media metrics are imperfect, they don't directly equate to influence, but at least in the German context, RT Deutsch has a significant foothold there. Uh, you also see they've had the biggest growth in terms of page followers over the last year. 
they have huge views on their own videos, and they post a lot. So this is one of the things we can, we can pull from our various data tools to get a sense of whether or not certain outlets actually have influence in some of the targeted populations. And then finally, this is a separate tool. This is called our Information Operation Archive. This is a historical archive of all of the information operations, state-backed information operations that platforms have taken down and publicly exposed. So for example, when Twitter released 3,000 accounts that they had attributed to Russia's internet research agency, we can put them all into this data set. It's searchable. So we have about 15 million data points. Doesn't work as a real-time monitoring tool, but it does help with sort of historical research to look at patterns how uh, various nation states have tried to influence voters in the past. So when we look at categories of information manipulation actors, what we tend to focus on on the dashboard at least are overt white actors. This is what we can see. This is sort of the tip of the iceberg, the above surface outputs from attributable media outlets, from diplomats, from government officials. You tend not to see particularly aggressive efforts to subvert elections coming from overt channels for the obvious reason. Most states want plausible deniability, so they're not gonna run a, a sophisticated hack and leak campaign through a state media outlet. So that's a limitation of what we're able to monitor on the dashboard. We do have a few accounts that exist in the gray area of manipulation actors. So these are outlets or accounts that don't reveal uh, any uh, direct connection to a state back actor. Sometimes these will be websites that present themselves as independent, like Southfront, uh, that the Department of Justice, uh, State Department have all identified as being basically commanded and controlled by uh, Russian military intelligence. But we also see some gray actors uh, who are just being financed somewhat covertly by state back actors. And then finally, this got a ton of coverage, of course, in 2016, the sort of black covert information manipulation actors. So these would be sock puppet accounts, accounts that present themselves as being within a targeted population, but are in fact being run by foreign actors. So this is one of the internet research agency accounts that pretended to be a Black Lives Matter activist. Uh, there's been a ton of research on these accounts and their ability to sort of burrow in to authentic uh, grassroots organizations and try to manipulate from within. It is an open question of how successful these accounts are, uh, but this is, I think, what most people think about when uh, people sort of conceptualize what an information operation looks like run by a state back actor. It's these covert accounts presenting themselves as something they're not. That also can include uh, things like outlets that present themselves as being local, uh, but again, are being controlled by a foreign actor. The Chicago Daily News, again, it was a Russian internet research agency account. So then we, we sort of look at different types of election manipulation. So again, what has gotten the most coverage over the years is political mis or disinformation, uh, which would be just false or misleading camp, uh, claims about candidates, political parties, or their supporters. This meme there of Trump actually is something he did not say. I had many friends who were sharing that. This is sort of a common technique to use memes and then attribute a quote to a political actor that they never said. State Backed actors, of course, target candidates that they want to either boost the likelihood of their election or undermine that candidate. My general sense is, at least in countries with large established uh, media outlets like the US, Canada, Germany, efforts by state act backed actors to manipulate at the political level probably are not particularly successful just because there's so much content out there. There's so much mis and disinformation. The domestic audiences are doing this is probably just a drop in the bucket. Also, there's efforts to influence at the sort of social topical level. So these are issues that voters vote on uh, rather than directly targeting a candidate uh, themselves. So it would be around migration, immigration. This again was taken from our information operations archive from 2016, efforts by Russia's IRA to sort of drum up fear about Obama Democrats immigration policies. Again, this usually occurs before election. It is trying to uh, either inspire voters to go to the polls and vote for a specific candidate or conversely keep them at home. But again, it typically just mirrors what we see in the domestic information space. Then there's voter suppression. So voter suppression, of course, is mis false or misleading claims about how, when, and where to vote. So the meme you see there was actually a domestic campaign that was run before 2016. 
targeting minority voters, meaning Democratic voters, telling them they could text in their vote for Hillary Clinton. There's actually a legal case uh, about this right now, so it's, it's going to be an interesting case to see if actually this is a legal activity, which would exist in a very, very small percentage of the type of disinformation that we see online that would be illegal. Most of it is not. Most of it does not even violate terms of service. But then what we do see state bag actors do is running campaigns with the intent to depress turnout. This again is an effort from Russia's internet research agency in 2016, targeting black activists to try to peel off support for Hillary Clinton. We saw this again in 2020, efforts to divide the left. So the effort here is not to say, you know, vote on Wednesday or vote on December 7th. It is just to undermine support for who is perceived to be the favorite candidate within a group. Then obviously this last election goes without saying voter fraud was the major issue. Russia has been seeding these narratives for years and years and years. This is what our Hamilton tool is helpful at surfacing is you can see a long uh, history of them uh, seeding doubt about election integrity. So every time that something pops up in the domestic media space, saying, you know, mail-in mail -in voting is not secure, there was an issue at a certain polling place, it gets amplified by state-backed actors. Again, though, largely what we see state-backed actors doing is providing an amplification network. Rarely are they providing a narrative that is entirely new or unique in the sort of voter fraud, voter suppression world. Now, now we're getting to the area where I think state-backed actors in the information space can have the biggest influence on an election, and that's with hack and leaks. So this is where there's a marriage of cyber and information operations. The one thing that states have that your normal domestic manipulators do not is a very sophisticated uh, military intelligence, intelligence units, cyber capabilities to be able to uh, get into emails, election systems, and pull out information that could be potentially damaging. And then, of course, leak that information through various inf information channels. Obviously, they're going to try to do this covertly. When Russia was able to get into the DNC emails, the Podesta emails, they didn't run that first through RT, again, for the obvious reasons, they don't want their fingerprints on it. But this, I think, is the area that we need to pay a ton of attention looking at the potential uh, influence of state back actors, because, of course, they have capabilities in the cyber domain that most domestic manipulators do not. And then this is related, but I'd put it in a slightly different category, is perception hacks. So this is where a state back actor is not specifically going in and uh, stealing sensitive data and then releasing it. It is essentially getting into the works of an information system so that they can be exposed, thus undermining uh, public confidence in the security of election systems. So efforts by Russia, Iran to probe uh, voting infrastructure often was accompanied by information operations that would essentially expose their own efforts. And that starts to chisel away at people's confidence that, because of course, well, if Russia was able to get into the voter rolls, what else were they able to do? So it's planting doubt in the minds of the electorate. And then this is sort of a new twist, and this is following up right on, uh, or right after what we saw happen in the Russian elections over the weekend. So it's what about is markets? It's a, what about is arguments. So efforts to undermine the very concept of election interference by sort of bastardizing the real meaning of what interference means. So Russia throughout this election period has accused Americans of meddling in their elections. Uh, the claims are uh, fairly absurd for the most part that, you know, Google and other tech companies weren't taking down opposition websites, things like that. So it's this false equivalency. But we see China do this as well. We always see the Iran Iranians do this. By saying that others are doing to you what you are doing to them, it starts to just undermine the very concept of election interference. And so it just cheapens uh, the study of the research of and efforts to expose these state factors is when they actually do try to interfere in elections. And then the final thing I do want to touch on, because I think a lot of times when we talk about information operations targeting elections or targeting any other um, hot button issue, we tend to think of it from the narrative level. But there's also something that happens at the sort of technical level and the architecture of the internet 
and how information is presented to audience. So it's search engine manipulation. So it's the tactics and techniques that they use to be able to get uh, favorable information or the information they want to get in front of audiences. This is a quote from Rene Duresta at Stanford that I like, if you make a trend, you make it true. What we now know, if you're not on the first page of Google, you might as well not exist. This again is a major advantage of state-backed actors because they have state-funded information outlets, media outlets. They have the ability to manipulate trending algorithms with bots, with trolling operations. So they're able to use high volume posts, posting from multiple different sources, multiple platforms, repeating messages over and over and over, and that allows them to fill data voids. So what happens is if the US media, if any sort of target population media is not discussing something, Russia, Iran can fill this void. They can essentially carpet bomb search terms and ensure that when people query them, they are getting a state back uh, perspective on a certain issue. So this is gonna be a total break, break from anything having to do with uh, political mis or disinformation, but I like it because I think it is indicative of how easy it is to game systems. So this was a restaurant in London that popped up, I think in 2015, 2016. And like every new restaurant, it started at the very end of TripAdvisor's rankings. Over the course of the summer, it was getting five-star reviews, five-star reviews, it started climbing up the charts. And within about nine months, this restaurant, the Shed at Dulwich, became the number one rated restaurant in the entire city of London on TripAdvisor. As you can see, a city with 18,000 restaurants. It was impossible to get a reservation, uh, mainly because the restaurant didn't exist. The whole thing was a spoof. It was a, a gag by a Vice News reporter to show how easy it is to manipulate ranking systems. So this was one guy with no real resources, uh, you know, clearly didn't have a, a foreign intelligence service on his behalf. He had a few friends posting fake reviews and he gamed the most trustworthy ranking system in one of the largest cities in the world. So take this example and the target is not a restaurant ranking, but the target is an election. And instead of one millennial guy reporter with no real resources, you take a nation state, they have foreign intelligence, they have media outlets, they have trolling operations, and they can have a significant effect on what audiences in a target population see. This again is not an election specific uh, example, but I think it shows the, the problem uh, or, or the capabilities of a state bag actor to game search engine rankings. So Fort Detrick, which if you've been following, has been the target of a Chinese information operation to say that the coronavirus originated at Fort Detrick, which is a US uh, bioresearch lab in Maryland. I went in, I queried Fort Detrick. All of my top results are from Chinese state media outlets. So this is their ability to carpet bomb a, a specific query and essentially own that space. And we see Russia doing this particularly well. So I searched, I'm only going to show one example, but many, many different topics that are of interest to Russia, like Sergei Skripal, who is, of course, the spy who was poisoned in London. And you're getting two of the top three results are from RT. I did this for a number of different queries around issues Russia cares about. And they essentially are able to own the information space because they're able to game the system and prioritize information that they want audiences to see. And again, there's been a democratization of manipulation efforts. You don't need to be particularly sophisticated now because there are all of these for-profit, for-hire companies that have popped up that will do manipulation, or, or manipulation activities for you. So it's sort of disinformation as a service. So yes, we need to worry about the state-funded actors, but we also need to look at these sort of mercenaries acting from abroad who can influence elections, often in tandem with, them, uh, with domestic actors. And then finally, my final point, and I, but I think this is critical, we tend to put all of our resources into looking at major federal elections, the US presidential elections, the midterms in the US, for example. Elections happen pretty much every day all around the world. And if you're looking at the ability to influence an election, it is really hard to influence a national election around a presidential candidate where people have very sort of hardened opinions. It is far easier to target, for example, a ballot measure. Uh, maybe in a state, people have sort of low, uh, low levels of understanding of what the ballot measure actually means. And state back actors have a much easier task of being able to, again, carpet bomb various queries to own the space, pay for advertisement, 
Uh, there's just various levers that state backed actors can use to manipulate like elections on the state and local level as well. The one example I gave, this is from Maine this last year where there was a ballot measure about, I think it was sort of hydroelectric, it was hydroelectric related. It was gonna directly influence a Canadian hydroelectric company that pumped in, I think three or $4 million into advertisements to try to defeat the measure. Now, this was all legal, I wanna be clear. This was definitely also not sort of condoned or sanctioned by the Canadian government, but it's just an example of the influence that state back actors can have on sort of down ballot measures or down ballot candidates that we tend not to pay a ton, a ton of attention looking at. The tech companies don't set up war rooms before local elections. And so there's a lot of manipulation efforts that can happen at the local and state level that are probably going undetected. And I will wrap up there so we can get to Q&A.